Good evening, and welcome to the Virtual Artist Cafe. From canvases to curations to couture and community, everything is open for discussion. This event is produced by the Baltimore Office of Promotion and the Arts, the City's Arts Council, Event Center, and Film Office. I'm Jackie Downs, Director of the Arts Council for Baltimore City, and am delighted to have you all joining us this evening. Tonight's talk will feature three talented women from the Baltimore area, visual artists Akia Brown and Monica Ikegwu. Akia Brown is a photographer, writer, curator, and researcher whose personal work investigates the implications of historical, racial, and social structures in relation to the development of contemporary Black life and identity within America. Monica Ikegwu is a figure painter whose work is structured upon the portraiture and depiction of African Americans. She uses her work as a platform to showcase routine occurrences of daily life that go unnoticed to the public. This evening's talks will be moderated by Angela Carroll, an artist, archivist, a purveyor, and an investigator of art history and culture. She is a contributing writer for several publications, including Hyperallergenic, Sugarcane Magazine, Black Art in America, Arts.Black, and Be More Art. Let the show begin. I present to you Monica, Angela, and Akia. Hey, Jackie. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm really grateful to be in conversation with um, with these these sisters, these fellow comrades, and in visual art, um, who are doing really extraordinary works right now. Uh, and so just to jump in and go ahead and get started, uh, Monica, I'm curious about your history. And I think for most uh, children of color, um, but particularly folks, you know, that are first generation, uh, their parents, you know, our parents want us to be doctors and lawyers and make all the coin. And, but here you are this extraordinary artist, um, but you initially were going to be a nurse. So can you talk a little bit about that, that transition from, from you know, a more theoretically practical field into, uh, into contemporary art? Okay, so for me, uh, when I was little, I always drew a lot. So I went to like elementary school, but then in middle school, they had art focused like curriculum. So I went to an art middle school. And then after that, I was still doing art. So I went to an art high school. And then after that, I was gonna like give up, drop off the art and, and become like a pediatrician because I was always told like medical is where the money is, you know, starving artist. Um, but yeah, so I applied to like five colleges and like four of them were medical. And then the last one was like the art school and I wasn't even gonna apply to it. And I applied to it last minute because my dad called me and was like, you're gonna apply to the art school? And I was like, no and he was like just do it and i was like okay so then i did it and then i got in and i ended up going there and it was kind of like a, a luck chance type thing i wasn't planning on making it full time but it just kind of happened that way mm -hmm. yeah and what about you akia like what was your kind of journey into becoming an artist and do you consider yourself to be a conceptual artist um that's a great question i i I don't know. I, I definitely navigate uh, within the arts, and that's my foundation. Um, but it's my practice is very much, um, I'd say, like a third of it really is the art and the research um, and the archives really drives a lot of that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I, I was focusing um, in art as a, as a child. Um, my mom's in business, my grandfather's a physicist, my uncle's an engineer, so I absolutely don't come from um, creatives at all, but uh, in my area, it was either sports or STEM, and I chose neither, and I chose art. Um, so I've, I've consistently been doing it. Photography has been really the root of a lot of it, and um, throughout high school, that's really what I focused on. Ended up moving to California mm -hmm. to go to an arts boarding school. Um, that's when I finished um, high school and then decided to come back to Micah. So um, it's always been rooted in, in the arts for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and sticking with you for a second, Akia, um, 
I think one thing that really uh, interested me in your work when I initially saw it uh, was the fact that you are constantly investigating the archive, right? That you are very deeply interested in the ways in which Black experience have been documented or, or are not documented and in creating kind of new ways in which our experiences can be seen um, specifically as installations um, or as as uh, art objects. And co so can you talk a little bit about how, what brought up that interest for you in, in creating archives of Black experience or even critiquing um, the archive or the canon of, uh, of art history? Yeah, um, for me, a lot of it really began in seeing the work being made by white artists, but also seeing work being made by other black artists that I wasn't relating to because it wasn't speaking to my particular experience. And it was the first time when I sort of validated that for myself that the black experience isn't homogenous. And um, I would say that a huge, a huge reason why I began to make my work was because I just wasn't seeing um, I wasn't really seeing the multiplicities in what the Black experience really is. Um, and so it, it was very much rooted in that, but then in photography, photography very much so in the conversation of um, contemporary art, it's, it's still relatively new in terms of being an art medium um, and isn't always seen as such. And especially with the accessibility of social media now. Um, there's a lot of different conversations about um, photography itself. And I'm sorry, can you repeat that? There was a yeah. truck or something random. <laughs> um, yeah, it, there's, there's a very interesting history about who uh, photography has been accessible to, um, who can even access the equipment um, traditionally, how chemicals actually exposed for black skin versus white skin, um, even color photography, how there really wasn't until the 90s, there really wasn't any conversations or any developments in the chemistry about how to actually develop and expose for darker skin. And so even when you look in movies and, and posters and maybe even your parents' pictures from when they were younger, they're, they're not even accurate representation. So I started to really think about what it meant to use photography and the archive and sort of question um, truth because we, we sort of believe because it's a photograph that it's true, um, but that's actually not really the case. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And I wanna, talking about sort of the image and the notion of black aesthetics, um, and the focus on black figuration, you know, Monica, I think that's one of the things that's really beautiful um, about your work is your attention to detail um, and how beautifully and elegantly you portray black skin and black people um, and, and brown people of, of all hues. And, and can you talk about why that, um, why that's important? Because I mean, you're, you're a skilled artist and you could really paint anything. Right? Yeah. Um, but you are you are specifically and explicitly choosing to focus on on black people. Um, why? Uh, as an artist, I think you could paint anything. I could paint like still lives. I can go abstract. Uh, for me, I've always like been drawn to people. So for me, figuration was something that I wanted to focus on. And with that figuration, I wanted to be connected to the people. So. I picked people of my own race because I can connect more with them. And also people, they're people that I'm surrounded with, people that I know most of the time. And also with the representation, you don't see a lot of black images. So with my paintings, I'm trying to create like a realistic depiction of people that, um, that other people can relate with as well. So there's my relation and then there's other people's relation that's also important. Just to, it's like a continual relation that people don't always get to see with other types of art. Yeah, and um, I'm gonna show uh, a piece right now, which hopefully we can see, which is Mood uh, Mood Blue oh. from 2016. 
And I think what's so extraordinary about this image, and I may need to, so we can just zoom in on there. Um, what's so beautiful about this image is also the growth, right? Um, yeah. Not only do you center people that are familiar to you or people that are in your community, but you also focus, you use yourself as, yeah. as a subject often. So um, just looking at Mood Blue from 2016 and then to see the growth um, of, and she saw blue in 2019. Uh, can you talk a little bit about just technique and and evolution, right? Because we can see just your growth in a, in such a short period of time, about three years, right? Yeah. So mood blue. I did that the summer before I had gotten into um into college. So that was like well, like still like high schoolish for me. And then um and she saw blue is what I did in my senior year of college. To be honest with you, I think it's continual re like repetition. Like the more you do it, the more you get better at it, the more you do it, the more things you pick up on, the more details you notice. Because at the moment when I did like mood blue, that was like really nice to me. Mm -hmm. But um, now going back all these years, I'm looking back and I'm like, I missed a lot of stuff. So I just think the more you do it, the more you understand, the more you can pick up on it, the more details, your eyes get trained more. And also with school, um, we did take like live model classes where you pick up every detail with the live model, even if they're moving and you learn to adjust to it. So even with those things, those small things, it just helps you develop your skills more, even without you like noticing it. Yeah, and just sticking with you for a second, Monica, so much, uh, I think another thing that's really powerful about your work and why people are so drawn to it is how, how bright it is, right? And how vivid uh, yeah. it is in your attention to color particularly your attention and understanding of color theory and as far as just the colors that that work well with melanin right with mm -hmm. melanated skins particularly darker skin tones so can you talk about how your use of color um and it feels like a lot of those pieces also um relate to a kind of an, an emotional or an intimacy with uh with your subject matter so um can you talk about how your use of color and how that kind of speaks to the characters or the subjects that you're portraying? For me, uh, I never took a color theory class, but um, I, the colors that I use for the pieces are kind of based, like they stem from the person. So like I always paint the figure first and I do their skin first. So once I have that down, that's from where like I choose the color that relates best to their skin tone. Like um, some people wouldn't look good next to purple, but other people would. But it's like determining, it's like based off of their skin tone, what works well with that, what complements them best. Um, which complements them the best. Like in photography, like some colors don't work good, but like same thing with painting, like some colors wouldn't look good with some skin tones and just figuring out that that's where the colors come from. Yeah. And I think what's also really beautiful is um, is that you're focusing on people who, as you stated, are are in the community, right? So there's something very familiar and like familial about uh, your subjects. And so can you talk about some of the people that are featured in your work? Are they all people that you know, or do you also have uh, folks that just kind of sit for you that you are not familiar with? Okay, so for the process, I find people and I do like, I photo, like I photograph them and I work off of the photos. My earlier work, um, because when I was still in school, I didn't have access to a lot of people because I also, I was commuting from school. So the earlier work is like my brothers and my sisters and myself. Mm -hmm. But recently I've been trying to branch out and find more people to get like more diverse, like I, more diverse group of people. So I've been getting people from school. And then um, I also take volunteers. So like people will like DM me on Instagram, like volunteering themselves and like, we'll set up a time and then I go and photograph them and then I'll paint off of that. But I'm basically open to having anybody, just, it's just access to people that I can get and people that are willing to work with me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so jumping to you, Akia, can you talk a little bit about your subjects? Because again, so much of the work that that you cover is, is steeped in photography, but it's also steeped in in research. It's a lot of uh, ephemera. It's a lot of um, images. It's a lot of writing. It's a lot of you know scraps. Um, and, and in many ways, I think that the way that you're visualizing the work is a kind of like pro it's a it's about process and memory work, which I find to be really um, you know really encouraging uh, when I as an archivist thinking about how do we make sure the black memory uh, is not forgotten, right? Or erased. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking especially about your collection of works. Um, I wanna be loved like a lady, right? Which 
are these really beautiful photographs of you and elder women. And if you can talk a little bit about that series and a little bit about the research that went into that project as well. And I'll see if I can show some images from it. Yeah, um, my, my subjects are always rooted in um, really the, the elders, the black elders that have instilled um, a lot in me. I'm, I'm the only child to a single mom, so I spent a lot of time with my grandparents and their friends. Um, and culturally, um, being from the South, there is a different level of engagement that I had with elders. Um, <clears throat> so they really are the root of a lot of my work. And I think why I focused on the past so much, because um, I was very intimately engaging with their experiences and um, what that meant for me and how I've been able to navigate and not have to navigate through certain situations. So, um, yeah, this this work in particular was actually from some images of uh, my family down in Mississippi and um, images that my great great grandmother had taken hmm. um, of her, um, her sisters and um, really just documenting each other. Um, but I never uh, had the chance to meet my great grandmother. We call her dear. And um, I never got to meet her. She died uh, a few weeks before I was born. And um, I actually got to know her through these images. Um, she has a lot of writing on there. The title, I Want to Be Loved Like a Lady, is actually something that she wrote on the bottom of one of the images. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I actually got to learn not just who I came from, but our similarities in personality um, through her words and through the images that she took. Um, and it was something that really stuck with me um, in particular, um, <clears throat> really paying homage to not just the elders that came before me, but especially Black women, um, the Black women that didn't have the same space and vulnerability to um, navigate as freely as I've been able to, um, and really thinking about what that has meant for me. Um, also being able to see thoughts um, and feelings expressed by a Black woman during a time when you don't really see that representation. I, I, I wasn't, um, I never really thought of my great grandmother as someone who thought that deeply about love or affection or sisterhood or motherhood. Um, you always have to think about them as being strong and tough and enduring a lot. Um, but that was not at all what I found in the images. It's not at all what I found in the writing. So it was something that um, really stuck with me and, and it still influences how I move through not just my practice, but my own womanhood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I f that uh, that attention to legacy and that attention to uh, generational memory and cellular memory is, you know, is just really is extraordinary. And I think it's important in this moment in particular, where um, it seems that there's a kind of, <laughs> you know, a kind of erasure of history, right? But also an erasure of memory. Um, and that lack of understanding of history has a deep impact on our contemporary moment, right? Uh, it has an impact on the uh, the fallacies that people project as truth. It has an impact on um, the protests that happen, the, uh, you know, the calls for action that are made, right? You can tell whether they are informed by an understanding of history or are informed by a lack of understanding of mm -hmm. history, right? An impact of such. Um, and I think that your recent project with uh, the Hamiltonian Gallery kind of speaks to that as well, right? Can you can you talk about your latest project, A Brown Millennial, and why that work is kind of relevant to the contemporary moment? Yeah, that, that work for me um, was the first um, body of work I've done in a few years that is um, personal and is looking inward instead of outward. Mm -hmm. um, I 
actually wanted to be a fashion designer before I settled on photography. So it's something where I sort of go back to my roots and really focus on a lot of the inconsistencies that I've had in my own identity and my environment that I've been in. Um, and I explore a lot of that through fabric and through textiles and inserting myself into those images, into that fabric, um, and bringing that as a part of the experience of the work. Um, so for me, I was really just um, experimenting with a lot of different ideas about what it means to be a Black woman, but culturally be isolated in a predominantly white community. Um, and the ways that I have felt um, not only isolated in my Blackness, but also isolated in the white communities that I've had to navigate through. Um, <clears throat> and especially thinking about um, my experience as um, a lighter skinned Black woman, I've often felt like I've been unsure of and also unwelcomed in actually talking about my experiences without having it centered on my privilege. So this for me was um, a time where I sort of gave myself that permission and uh, really did focus on that, but through the lens of the communities and the imagery that I was seeing um, and being inundated with as I was trying to figure out who I was. Um, so this, this series really um, is a reflection of my journey over the years and sort of looking back at that foundation and um, how much it really warps, not just your self-perception, but um, the perception that others have of you and, and understanding um, the performance of identity and the performance of, of, of being a Black woman. Um, that's often not consistent with um you know not mass media i would say mm -hmm. yeah can you talk a little bit about um because so much of and you know i'm not that much older but i am in my 30s so i feel like i'm old um and i feel like so much of for like official millennials so much of your reality is dictated through through social media right um and so the image, particularly the, the image of the self, becomes really prominent in how the world sees you, right? Or how you perceive yourself in the world, how you perceive success in the world. And what I thought was really interesting about the body of work is um, also the way in which you engage different kinds of hairstyles, right? Like different kinds of femininity, different kinds of Black experience, but also the juxtaposition of that with very, very white popular culture images from a, from a particular time period, right? That is not millennial, right? That is rather dated. And so I was curious about why, um, why you chose that particular imagery um, in relation to, you know, a very young and very present you in a contemporary moment. Yeah, um, so, so those, those uh, fabrics are from an American uh, vintage textile collection. So something that um, I'm really fascinated by is this idea of Americana and what it actually means to be African American and never really feeling American, um, but recognizing that the communities I navigated also were predominantly white, pre predominantly conservative, predominantly middle class. Um, and culturally, there's a lot of um, symbolism within that that did take place in the imagery that I was seeing. And so when I came across this um, fabric collection, and it was being marketed as something that was in a, a vintage American collection, it just really made me think about how many people um, contributed to America and visually have been completely left out of that. Um, even looking back into archives, looking back into uh, movies and music, there, there's actually not that much representation of all the people of color, not just Black people, um, but all Blacks and immigrants and non-Black people of color who have contributed to this landscape and um, the culture. 
Um, and it just, um, it was something where I really felt it was important to juxtapose myself with that because these were things I was seeing daily. Um, they, they're definitely not images that, um, I'll, you know, some black people experience, but I was experiencing them every day and not seeing myself in them. Um, so I thought it was really important to also give some insight into, um, I, I think the differences in being black in America, which sometimes really can be a culturally and socially isolating experience. Um, and I think it brings representation to um, another meaning. Um, and with social media, that is something that I've honestly had a very interesting relationship to. I'm a young artist, I'm a millennial, but I absolutely hate social media. Um, I think that it sort of forces you to navigate in a certain way, depending on your medium, especially. Um, I am a photographer and um, Instagram really was rooted in photography when I first got it. But, um, you know, it's one thing to notice the way that people receive me when I post pictures of myself and then the lack of engagement when I share my work. Um, and that's something that um, I became really conscious about a few years ago and have very strategically not shown work for that reason because I, I didn't really want to have an audience because I was a pretty face. I wanted to have, have an audience because um, my work was actually valued. Um, and even, even the structure of social media now, you sort of scroll through and, and don't really have to sit with the work. Um, and I spend months and months researching and interviewing and doing oral histories before I even pick up the camera. Um, and all of that work is not seen in a, in a square on, on Instagram. So mm -hmm. um, I think, it, I think it, sh it functions very differently for different people, but it's been something that um, for me has been more of a space of updating people, um, but also recognizing that you can sustain a practice without sharing your work um, on that platform which I think there needs to be more conversations about that actually, because it, it can create um, a very unhealthy culture of feeling like you have to be constantly producing work. I work very, very slowly. Um, and, you know, I had to sort of check myself and be like, um, is this something I, I want to show because I'm proud of it? Or is it something I want to show because I feel like this is what's expected of me? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's, 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 it's constantly fluctuating my relationship to social media. Yeah, and so a similar question to you, Monica, because it seems that a lot of galleries in particular are searching for young um, contemporary artists, particularly young black artists in this moment, right? Um, and, are, and are finding folks through, through social media, but, but through Instagram in particular. And so can you talk a little bit about how social media has been a kind of tool for you uh, to, to, get, to get the word out about the work that you're doing. For me, social media, um, like I do feel like, like Akia was saying, it does have like the, the feeling that it pressures you to push work out a lot. And I do have that, like you want to keep the engagement for like your audience. So you keep putting out work every week because if you don't, people are going to forget about you and then they won't like your stuff and then you won't get exposure. But um, even with that, I do I do think it's a helpful tool um, just because of the exposure part. You are getting more people to look at it. Galleries can find you through your hashtag, um, through your username. And like even like in this moment, a lot of people have actually found me like um, with the Black Lives Matter um, campaign and, uh, and the attention being brought on to black artists. They um, lots of people have actually found me like I've went from like 9,000 to 17,000 in like a matter of like a month because through my Instagram. So people that have never heard of me have found me through social media. And in that way, it is helpful for exposure. Um, in this moment with galleries finding black artists, I think it's, it may be a like an in the moment thing. I don't know how long it's gonna sustain like in the future. Like, I don't know if they're gonna continue on with that in the future or if it's just like a trend top thing right now. But, um, Currently, I do think social media is good. It's a good thing and a bad thing. It has its pros and its cons, but it is good for exposure. And so, and currently, just sticking with you for a second, Monica, 
you are currently represented by Gallery Mertice and Band Devices out of LA, or? Yep, yep. both. Um, and would you say both of those were found through like personal relationships or for, for young folks who were interested in how do you even navigate having gallery representation, you know, what, uh, particularly right out of, out of undergrad, right? Because you've just recently graduated from MICA. Um, can you talk a little bit about what that process was like for you to, to navigate um, joining or figuring out how to work with the gallery system, which can be kind of an intimidating process, especially for young artists? So for me, I, um, I was working with Band Devices first and that was back in 2017. And they had found me through Instagram actually. Um, so they reached out to me and then we started working together. For me, um, working with galleries was a new thing. I haven't done it before. And um, it, was, it was a little challenging getting used to like the business side of the art, apart from like just the art making it, but like the contracts and like the sending out works and like meeting deadlines, that was all new to me. And beginning with that, um, it was a little hard, but now I'm more familiar with it. And um, with Gallery Martise, that one wasn't through Instagram. That one was through a show, actually, in Baltimore, where um, the owner of Gallery Martise, um, she came in and she saw my work on the wall and she requested to meet me. And then she asked if she could represent me. And then that's how that started. Um, it wasn't like I didn't know her previously. She just saw my work through the wall and asked for contact. And from there, that's where the relationship started. So it was two different ways of meeting the galleries. Yeah, and shout out to um, to Sister Martise, who has been, you know, such a mentor and supporter of Black art and Black artists just all over the world, really, but particularly in in Baltimore. Um, you know, just we need that. We need that kind of mentorship consistently from from our elders. So, you know, we're very appreciative of that. Um, Akia, can you talk a little bit about how you've navigated? Um, exhibitions, because you're not currently represented by a gallery um, at this point. Is that correct? Um, yes, I just left mm -hmm. Hamiltonian, so I am fully independent. Mm -hmm. now. And is that, um, do you find that to be kind of more beneficial or that you have more control? Um, mm -hmm. how, how have you navigated just the process of being an, now an independent artist? Um, I... I I would say, um, well, I actually worked at uh, Gallery Martinez. I think that's the first time I met you, and mm -hmm. uh, but I I think that um, working at a gallery and being represented by one has given me, I would say, a deeper insight to the type of artist that I'm not, and I think that. Um, it's been a very interesting time where I felt more empowered to, I guess, redefine what an artist can look like and what a practice can look like, um, and not always having it rooted in being attached to a gallery. Um, I'm also very particular with who has my work. Um, I don't often sell work. Um, I take images of myself and my family. It's not necessarily something I want hanging up in someone's house. Um, because it's a very personal process for me and also for them to, to give that space um, to be vulnerable. Um, so, you know, I, I also have a lot of feelings about who owns my work and, and what they're doing with it after they have my work, um, how it is being flipped and how I'm ultimately not profiting from that. So there's a, there's a lot of things um, on the back end of it that I personally don't agree with, but I think that um, I also don't really make the work for galleries, you know? Um, I think I sort of got to the point where I was having a lot of shows and then I realized none of the people coming into these spaces are the people that I actually are, am making the work for. Um, they're not the reasons I made this work in the first place. Um, and so their, their value of it is not going to be the same. So I, I think I have, um, you know, and not just in my practice, in my um, professional life also, I work independently. So I really um, have been fortunate to be able to move independently and say the things I want to, um, um, to say, say yes, say no when I want to. Um, and have the, the freedom to do things my way and actually demand that and demand a certain amount of 
um, respect up front and knowing that if I am working with you, it's because I, I value you and I feel like you truly value me. Um, and it, it does come with a, it does come at a cost. It, it comes at a huge cost of saying no um, and often being left out of certain things. But um, I think ultimately I take a lot more pride in um, when I show my work. Um, as opposed to just showing it just because I can. Um, and so that's another space that um, I'm, I'm walking in now. Yeah. Yeah. And um, thank you for sharing that. I think, you know, if nothing else, what this moment has, has taught us is the importance of knowing your yeses and your noes, right? And like knowing what you have the capacity for and what is just, you know, a no, right? And, and feeling really confident and secure in, in that. Um, speaking of which, I've been rereading and thinking a lot about like Elizabeth Catlett lately and just like all of the warriors that precede us, particularly women artists. And she wrote this essay um, called, you know, The Role of the Black Artist. And for her, and we talked about this a little bit in our other conversation, for her and so many of you know, the elder black artist, really the, the burgeoning artist that created what we now understand to be black art um, for the role of the black artist was specifically and explicitly to create reverent, you know, um, healing images that countered longstanding histories of stereotypes and propagandas that have ultimately shown black folks to be less than human, right? Subhuman really. Um, and now uh, there are so many movements that are kind of rebelling against that respectability politic, right? There are a lot of people that are saying, look, I'm, you know, I'm human, right? Black, black subjects are not monolithic and, and we are human, right? So we should be able to show us in a spectrum of ways, right? Messy and, um, and genius, right? So I'm curious about what you both feel are your roles as artists um, particularly in relation to, you know, social or political change um, or information, if that's your role, if you feel that if you're, if you feel that your work um, can be a kind of tool or a weapon um, for people for black liberation or for liberation period, or if you feel that you're just creating work because you enjoy, you know, beautiful black people. And if that's the case, that's cool too. But I'm curious about um, what you think ultimately your role in this moment as, as an artist is? Mm. Big question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I think I would say that, um, I think my role as an artist is first and foremost to make sure that my family is recorded and that my family knows that they're important and valid and, um, making sure that they know that I appreciate what they've gone through so that I can even have the, the life at being 24 to take pictures for a living. Um, and that in itself is an immense privilege. Um, I think thinking about, uh, I guess sort of this larger black, uh, you know, collective liberation, I think that we're, we're all in it. And I think that I really value the individual individuality within that collectivity at the same time. Um, I think that I am also really, I'm really interested in seeing um, different stories and, and different representations of of, of blackness. Um, I think that the main reason I started to make work was because I wasn't really seeing my own black experience being talked about. So that's really, um, <clears throat> I think in, in the engagements I've had and people um, coming up to me talking about their work, um, I know that there's a lot of people out there who are black, who are creatives, who still feel unseen. Um, and I think that the work that is often celebrated now is sometimes celebrated because it's more palatable for white people to not actually have to sit with themselves and not actually have to think about um, their role in things. Um, so I'm also, I, I think that my work is for who it's for, um, but I'm not concerned about that. That's not really why I make my work. Um, I make it because I know that my voice is important and I'm not going to allow myself to be silenced. Um, and if someone 
connects to that, then um, it, it feels a little better, but it's absolutely not uh, what pushes me. Um, and, and I will say that my practice in particular is one that is the only space that I really engage in these conversations. I don't really often engage in discussions about identity or race or really any of this outside of my practice. So it's very much been a way for me to uh, work through a lot of these things and keep my sanity in my day to day and actually having to experience them. So uh, it's been a very um, intentionally um, personal, personal space for me. Um, oh, <laughs> did you want to say something? I was going to cue you. I was going to ask what you were you talking about. Okay. <laughs> okay um, so for me and my work, um, I want to, like it's for black people, but also people who are not black. For black people, it's a way for them to feel um, connected and to see them see them in like a in a correct in like a uh, like a correct depiction of themselves. And then for non black people, for them to see black people as they are, because as you said, people have like stereotypes built into their minds of what people of like what black people are supposed to dress like, what they look like, you know how they're perceived as. And with my images, I want them to like show people as they are. So then when they see it, I hope that it breaks down that, that, that imagery that they have in their head and they open up their minds to new possibilities of what people, of what we look like and um, how we are projected to look like. And not just what, um, you know, what media projects or like what, me or what movies show or on TV, stuff like that. Um, but it's just opening up a new door of perspective for people to see. I think that's the main goal that I'm trying to do. I mean, yeah, that's probably, yeah, that's, that's probably the main goal, yeah. Right on. Um, I'm, I'm curious about how, what your experience has been because both of you are based in Baltimore. Both of you have you know, attended and, and graduated from MICA. Um, can you talk a little bit about what your experience being an artist in Baltimore and navigating the kind of Baltimore art scene has been, um, or what you know, it's lovingly called small Baltimore, right? Because it's a very small kind of nexus. Um, but we also know that a lot, there's a lot of siloing that happens in Baltimore city because our city is still very segregated. Um, and then is further segregated based on our association to institutions. Um, so there are a lot of artists who are just now kind of coming about or being getting more recognition um, that previously maybe would have been ignored before um, because they haven't attended Hopkins or haven't attended MICA, et cetera. Uh, so can you talk a little bit about your experience being an artist in Baltimore? Did you find that it was supportive? Um, did you find uh, you know, that you had allies and had great opportunities to kind of grow your work? Or did you find uh, that there were some struggles that you had to push through and that maybe some artists are still pushing through here? Um, I think, I think that I've been able to thrive um, working independently and being able to navigate in between um, contemporary photography and um, academia because I've been in Baltimore, um, but I don't necessarily think that I have really felt supported by the Baltimore arts community. Um, I don't necessarily feel that. Um, I think that in a good and bad way, Sondheim gave me credibility that people weren't willing to give me until certain institutions um, gave, gave that validity to, to what I had to say. Um, and even then, I think that a lot of people, um, you know, I was also the youngest person there. I had a very different curation of work, which really was not rooted in art. So I feel like Baltimore, honestly, while I rep it, I'm not even, I'm from New Orleans and I, I rep Baltimore all day, every day, but um, I very much think that a lot of the ways I've had to navigate have really been independently um, because I don't necessarily think that, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, in the past few years, there's been very particular artists who are showing 
uh, you know, it almost feels like we know the same artists, they get the same shows, they get the same opportunities. Um, and there really isn't much room for anyone else to be heard until someone um, tells you, like, you're important. Um, and I think that there's a certain level of, um, of advocating for our, ourselves a little bit more that, that we have to do, um, not just as Black creatives, but especially in Baltimore, and not allowing others to define our narrative and being okay with doing that ourselves, even if it means um, that you're not included in the conversations. Um, so I definitely think that uh, in a lot of ways, Baltimore has been uh, supportive of me, but I think also Baltimore is a little unsure of what to do with me um, and even calling me an artist. Um, and that's a space that, you know, I'm still, I'm still navigating through. Um, but it's, it's one that's forced me to step into my own voice a little bit more uh, fully and a little bit more strong and um, I guess just unapologetically. So um, I appreciate the space. I think it's forced me to grow in a lot of ways, but I think that the support, um, it, yeah, it's also come in different ways. For me personally, um, like I went to Micah and that's like in the middle of Baltimore City and I've been there for four years, but I haven't really been into the art scene in Baltimore uh, until like recently, like the past year. Um, even though, I, because I was at Micah, but I didn't know anything about it. And I think it's access to like certain people who are, who are in it that give you access to that. Because once I started meeting curators and, um, and other artists that were from Baltimore, that's when I was opened up to the places where people were showing. Because before that, I had no idea. Um, so from that, I think it's, it's, that's why it's so small because people don't have access to the people who are in it. Before that, I had no idea of it at, like whatsoever. So I think like just connections will get you into that. And once you have that connection, then you are open up to more spaces. Like I didn't, um, like, um, like City Hall where they had some shows. Um, I had no idea of that before I met the curator there. And um, that's just how it went. Like I met one person and I was open up to one space. I met another person and I was open up to another space. And I think once you have those connections and you establish it with those people, they open you up to new things that you can see because before I didn't know anything before, um, I think before like what, 2019, I didn't know anything about it. So I just think connections are like the important key to it. Yeah, and, and adding to that, what, I mean, what advice would you give to, you know, young artists that are based here that again, are maybe completely separate or isolated from, not connected to major institutions who want to get their work out, um, get their work out there or just need some inspiration to keep making the work. Um, what, what, what advice or thoughts can you give uh, to young artists that are based here that may help them in this moment? I've been fortunate enough to have people like, um, to contact me and then get in touch with me. But if that doesn't happen, you can always go out and search for them, like search for the institutions, the art institutions in Baltimore and contact them and have them look at your work and ask them for advice, ask them for places to go to, I think. Like if they don't reach out to you, then I think that you should go and reach out to them and um, and they, they can get you the connections that you need as well. Yeah, and I think um, I would say um, just feel feel uh, that confidence in yourself to <clears throat> not not just make creation uh, connections, but to to seek them out and to be okay with seeking them out, um, even if they're outside of of this community. Um, I do think it's. It's also very important to remember, um, like there's life outside of Baltimore, there's experiences outside of Baltimore, there's people outside of Baltimore, and it is definitely small enough where sometimes we, we're, you know, you're in the day to day and it's like, oh, right, like there's, there's other art communities, you know, I can access these spaces whenever I want to, I have the power to manifest the relationships that I want and that I need. And sometimes it's okay to realize that uh, that community might not be here in Baltimore. 
you can you can still do the work you can still be inspired by it but it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be confined um to this place but i also think that you know really questioning who who you're allowing to give you validity and who you're allowing to affirm you is really important and recognizing that if you can't do that for yourself uh, none of those outside forms are, are really even going to satisfy you. Um, and you, you do really have to get to the point of like hyping yourself up, being, being your own hype woman, hype man, hype person, whatever. And just feeling empowered to be like, um, you know, I, I can do this. I'm capable of doing it. And if these people don't feel like, you know, engaging with my work or if uh, my work isn't marketable enough or sellable enough, uh, it doesn't mean it's the end of the road. It just means I have to pick another road uh, or maybe, you know, pave that road for myself. So, um, you know, I think Baltimore is a place that also has a huge DIY community, unlike so many other cities. And you, I think the benefit is you actually can make a name for yourself here um, with a lot more um, accessibility to do that than in other landscapes. So also, you know, at the same time, like appreciate the space that you're in and recognize that if you want to start something here, you absolutely can. It, it ha we, you know, we do it every day here. Definitely. Um, I wanted to, we have a few more questions, but we definitely want to open it up to the audience as well. If you do have any questions, feel free to drop those in uh, the question box or the comment box, however you're watching, whether it's on Facebook or YouTube, um, send us any questions that you have. And in the last few minutes, we'll definitely try and fit you in. Um, I'm curious about what you all have been inspired by, right? Because I feel like this moment is also about like staying encouraged in the midst of, of quarantine, um, making sure that you know self-care regimens are taken seriously in all the ways. I personally have been deep diving black, you know, into really deep like uh, black cinema and weird sci-fi shit, like from the seventies. It's been giving me all the life and all the happiness, as well as random comic books um, and uh, really bad anime. Um, what, what's been inspiring you all? And uh, both of you are muted right now. <clears throat> Um, what has inspired me is um, food, absolutely. Um, I love to eat. I like thinking about eating. Um, I like planning to eat. So uh, yeah, a lot of my inspiration really is centered around food, um, understanding culturally where my food comes from, um, how all of the Black women <laughs> who were forced to cook really created American cuisine um understanding that history um just constantly educating myself on um all aspects of my blackness but really through music and food and clothing and and, and all sorts of things like that but um my i'd say my biggest inspiration is absolutely my grandparents to this day um every single time i have a conversation with them it, it puts me into um a perspective that gives me a deeper awareness for, for my purpose, but also the, the, the flexibility that I have. And, and while understanding the body that I navigate through, recognizing how much more freedom I have to do that because of them. Um, so yeah, it's definitely an inspiration for me. Uh, for me, when it comes to my work, I would say inspiration comes from um, personality and clothing. Since like a heavy focus on people, like everybody has like a different personality. And with those people, you meet like some people and you you instantly want to paint them. And then you meet other people and you're like, hmm, he'd be interesting to paint. She'd be interesting to paint. Just personality gets you interested in the models that you're painting. Also with clothing, like when you meet people, um, you know them through like what they say and like what they wear. So like when I paint people, I want them to, you know, understand the person through like their attire, you know, because I, I do let the people choose what they wear. So then um, like they have free reigns to control that. So like just focusing on their clothing and how they present themselves and how they want to be seen. The clothing is also interesting to me and how I want to present people as well. 
Speaking of presentation and representation, um, you your work was featured on OWN in the show, Cherish the Day. And this is a comment from viewer Julia Boone. Thanks for your question, Julia. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that process? Like how did that that happen? I mean, it's pretty magical, it's pretty, pretty major. Yeah, that, um, yeah, that happened. Um, so that was a connection with um, my gallery in California. Um, they had the hookup for that. And they asked me if I wanted to be featured with that. And it was like right, the filming was right before my solo show there. So I had to like send all the stuff there like really, really early. But um, they got the connection. They just asked me if I wanted to be a part of it. And I was like, yeah, sure. Yep, let's do that. So then I just sent them the work there like uh, earlier so they can do the filming. And then that's when that took place. And we have another question um, about upcoming shows. Uh, do you do you all have anything planned for 2021? And this is from our great curator, organizer, um, filmmaker uh, in his own right, Kirk. Um, yeah, talk about some of your upcoming projects. Um. Yeah, so next year um, I will be showing at Museum of Contemporary Art in Tucson. Um, I'm pushing at a residency schedule for this year, but a lot of things have been um, pushed back to um, next year. Um, another possible museum show I can't necessarily talk about right now, but um, I do have a lot of, of things planned um, and scheduled that um just in terms of like scheduling i can't talk much about them but um yes 2021 is already a, a books year so i'm excited so i have some i had some things some things got pushed back like like really back far away um again it's like i can't talk about it because they're not even like set in concrete yet but um there's a couple of shows that are now set and scheduled in 2021, but I have no idea like when they will actually happen. But yeah, that's about it. Yeah, everything is sort of, you know, up in limbo right now um, for all of us, which is really interesting as far as what, what's gonna happen in the new year. Uh, the importance of staying optimistic um, is, uh, is everything. We have a cool, question from um, from amazing visual artist Zoe Charlton, who's in the building. Um, she said, uh, appreciate Angela's comment, read in regards to institutions that we were talking about earlier. Uh, Monica Nakia, how do you both reflect upon the experiences you had within academia, considering the limited information uh, regarding black artists um, from professors? So how did you ultimately navigate um, being students at an institution where you rarely, and Akia, you spoke to this a little bit earlier, um, but being a student where you rarely uh, learned about yourself or learned about other Black artists, um, and maybe even rarer had Black professors or professors of color even at Micah. Yeah, um, I, I went to Micah as well um, and almost dropped out. Um, a good four or five times for that exact reason. Um, it was definitely a situation where um, I, I was consistently asked to leave class for the way I talked about my work, for making white students uncomfortable, for only caring about work by black people, just a lot of ignorant comments. Um, but I will say that I only had two professors of color throughout my entire four years there. Um, and both of them influenced me immensely and they are solely the reasons why I stayed. Um, but yeah, I think in all honesty, I felt very isolated and I felt as if I was not getting the same education. So that was very, very frustrating. I couldn't get people to talk about my work at all. And um, the project that really launched my career is the project that no one would talk about in, in school. Um, and it's, I, I will say that um, I genuinely don't think I would have it any other way because I don't think I would have pushed myself as much as I did 
if I had had more support from them. Um, so in a way, I'm I'm very I'm very grateful for it, honestly, because it forced me to to sort of um, recognize things a little quicker and also recognize how I wanted to situate myself in institutions and and if I even wanted to do that um, and really questioning um, the elitism within academia and 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 how many intelligent people are prohibited from from getting those accolades for a multitude of reasons. Um, you know, it was a situation where I was working five jobs to stay in school while being a full-time student. And there would be critiques about not enough time spent on the work. Um, but, you know, I was trying to, to pay to make the work, <laughs> essentially. So um, it's, it's, um, it's something I appreciate. I'll just say it's something I appreciate. It was frustrating, but uh, it, 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 it forced me to move a lot differently. Yeah, like Akia said, um, when you don't have access to the black teachers um, and black artists aren't given to you all the time, you are forced to go and research that by yourself when it's not handed to you. I think I've only had one professor in all four years that was black while at MICA. And, um, and with studio classes and the painting classes, um, I was, those are, they're, um, my bad. They're rare moments when you get artists, like visiting artists who come in that are black, that you get um, access to, because they have like a sign up sheet where you get to write your name. And then if your name's on that list, you get to see the artist. And it's like, it's a frenzy when like that one black artist comes like once a year and there's like 20, like 20 names that can only see the artist. So like all the black students rush to get someone who looks like them to go and view their work. So those moments were rare and they were very helpful, but they were very rare. That's the thing. Um, so when you aren't given those moments, a lot of the time you have to go out and search for yourself and learn about the artist. And also in like the, um, the art history classes where they have like the survey artists that are all white, they just throw that at you, like all of them. Um, yeah, just being exposed to like the classic white artist and then not having anyone that looks like you. You have to go out and search that for yourself because primarily they're not gonna give it to you. Yeah, thank you for that transparency. And I think all of us have had to navigate that in our particular fields, right? Finding ourselves and making sure that we aren't erased. Um, have some really great questions uh, from Facebook and from YouTube. One of them coming from um, Sister Jackie Down, who says, you both seem so self-assured and solid in your craft and selves. Yes, we love to see it. Um, what grounds you uh, in this moment and what grounds you period in your art? Sort of depends um, on the day. <laughs> yeah. Um, what 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 grounds me? I would say um, honestly, my connection to the universe and to my ancestors, and and consistently um, checking in with myself, um, and honestly, really allowing my own intuition to sort of guide me, and honestly, not not really worrying too much. Um, I don't think there's ever been a time when the universe hasn't provided for me. Um, and it has often been walking in faith. Um, but, but, you know, when you when you recognize that your ancestors and the universe is, is always with you, uh, will always provide, it becomes very easy. It becomes very easy. There's no other way to, to navigate, honestly. Yeah, facts. Uh, for me, I would say it's a mixture of trust in God and then overconfidence. Um, so like when you when you're when you're sure of yourself, when you like you already ha you have too much confidence in the first place and you already know that a plan's already been set for you and like you're going to succeed no matter what. You just keep doing your work and you keep going. You keep pushing forward. And with that, um, sometimes you don't care about the negative, the negativity that people say about your work or like um like I've been called several times um, stubborn because I didn't follow what the teachers would say um, or follow the rules that they would give me. Um, they'd be like, you're just very stubborn. Why did you just 
why didn't you listen? I'm like, I didn't want to because it's the work that I wanted to do. And I wanted to do it this way. Um, so that overconfidence plus just knowing that you're going to succeed because there's a plan already set for your life um, just helps you continue forward. Yeah, excellent. And so um, we are running a few minutes over time. So we want to go ahead and have one last question from Sister Donna Drew Sawyer, who says, um, do either of you have the opportunity to mentor other artists? Good question. The opportunity or, or the desire, because both of you are, are pretty busy um, in your fields as well. Um, I haven't had the opportunity. Like I had a summer job where I worked um, with elementary school kids at an art program, but that's about it. I haven't had, I haven't had the ability to mentor like people who will really want to make art as their career. Uh, I'd be open to it. Um, I mean, I'm a little busy right now, but I'd be open to it. To be honest with you. Yeah, um, my a lot of my background is in teaching, um, so um, specifically in the nonprofit sector. So uh, mentorship has always been something that I have valued personally. Like I, I have, um, I understand the the value of having a mentor, um, though I, and I'm I'm always open to it, but. Um, yeah, I, I think that sometimes it is one thing to see like the someone's practice from the outside and there's another part of actually realizing like the day to day of like keeping that going. Um, so yeah, that's something I'm trying to navigate is how do I like bring people into that, but make them very aware of like it's a it's a constant thing that you're doing. You're, you're constantly working, uh, constantly pushing yourself. Um, but I think it's important to to have people to help guide, um, I guess, how you think about yourself and, and how you can see yourself um, sort of moving, so. Yeah, definitely. Mirrors, reflections. Um, I want to uh, just thank you both for taking the time to speak with me today and speak with everyone. I think all of us were you know, kind of sad that we weren't able to have all of our festivals this year. This doesn't necessarily replace Artscape, you know, but I think it's a beautiful opportunity for folks who, um, you know, maybe are familiar with your work, but didn't have a chance to understand how brilliant you both are to hear you in conversation, you know, discussing your practice and your process. Um, we also want to take a moment to just thank uh, the Baltimore Office of Promotion in the Arts for producing the Artist Talk. And they're doing a whole series of awesome things uh, called Art in August, ultimately, uh, and where they're going to be engaging with other artists and other talks. There's another one coming up this Friday, actually, so you want to be sure to check out uh, all of BOPA's uh, social media to find out uh, about that as well. Uh, there's also an event called the Artscape Online Artist Market that BOPA will have more information posted about on, on their social media handles as well. Um, you can check them out on their website at uh, www.promotionandarts.org. Uh, uh, there should be some information on the social media that you're watching this through uh, to show you how to keep in touch with BOPA. Uh, and before we end, how can folks stay uh, and learn more about everything that you all are both doing? Um, you know, put your social media out there if you have any, any things that you want to plug in this moment. You, you definitely can do that as well. Um, for me, the most um, up-to-date current thing that you can use to find me would be my Instagram. Uh, I would say use my main Instagram, at Monica165. And from there, if you go to like the link in my bio, you can also find my website. And my galleries are also tagged in my bio as well. So from there, you can find everything else. Yeah, um, you can follow me on Instagram at Akia Brown, spelled like it is on the screen, um, or my website, akiabrown.com. Um, I am more responsive to emails than DMs, but either way, I will get back to you. Score. <laughs> and uh, I'm Angela and Carol. I'm on Instagram as Angela underscore N underscore Carol. I think we'll make a shorter name. <laughs> um, 
And uh, you can hit me up there or on my website, Angela and Carol. Dot com. Thank you all again. Um, stay safe, stay encouraged, um, stay empowered, and uh, talk to you all soon. Thank you. Thanks.